I have spent my life searching for the naughty dog mascots that my father and my father's father failed to find. Who were Jack and Daxter? Why did they go from simple platforming to a GTA-style city? How did they make it work and make an interesting world? What is Eco? And how does it work? I have asked the plants. They do not remember. The plants have asked the rocks, but the rocks do not recall. Even the rocks do not recall. Hello everybody and welcome back to another episode of The Science Of. The show where I take a look at the science behind your favourite game shows and more. So today, we're going to be taking a look at a classic game from the people over at Naughty Dog. No, not Keith the Thief or Cash Banuka. Today, we're taking a look at the science behind the classic platform collectathon, Jack and Daxter. But I can't cover Jack and Daxter all by myself, so I've brought in a Jack and Daxter expert to help me out. Hey, and that's where I come in. Hey, everybody. I'll be your guide throughout the magical world of Jack and Daxter, and you can call me Jericho. Okay, first off, I already know you're asking yourself, hey, is this guy even qualified to be talking about a game that was released more than 20 years ago? To answer your question, this is my favorite game of all time. Alright, some background information on Jack and Daxter. So, the game was released in 2001 as an exclusive for the PlayStation 2. Also known as the best console ever. Fight me, I don't care, I'll win, it's amazing. Jack and Daxter follows the titular protagonist as they journey throughout a fantastical fantasy world, progressing through different landscapes and collecting shiny objects known as precursor orbs and power cells. And if you hate collectathons, aka games where you have to go around and collect a bunch of stuff, well, I got news for you. There are 2,000 precursor orbs and 101 power cells for you to get. Alright, let's go discuss the world that these guys live on. So the entire planet is filled with a bunch of colorful cartoony characters that are always happy to help out Jack and Daxter on their quest. In return for a little assistance or for extra pocket change that they can spend on, you know, useless junk. Some of these missions in the early game can range from helping an old farmer tend to his yak house. Yes, I know that's completely original, a yak and a cow mixed together. Or you can even walk up to a giant pelican and punch it in the throat so it throws up an icky gooey power cell. Well actually, if you want to hang out after this, I can teach you how to skip that entire mission with a few sticks of dynamite and a jar of Nutella. Anyway, while a lot of this can be achieved through your basic kick, punch, and jump, sometimes Jack and Daxter need to harness the ultimate power of Eco, which conveniently comes in a six flavor variety pack. Personally, I don't like grape, but I really like blue raspberry or even orange. So, the first one is Green Eco, which acts as your health throughout the game. Blue Eco, which allows Jack and Daxter to run extra fast, draw collectibles towards them, and activate precursor ancient technology. Ooh, fancy. So, the red one is uh, one that increases Jack's physical strength so that he can just punch through insane armor. And then finally, Yellow Eco, which turns Jack's fists into like gangly long arm cannons, which can shoot pure energy as if he was some kind of Super Saiyan. Now, all of these are pure science fiction. I mean, that should be pretty obvious. We've got floating balls of plasma that go around giving you super speed, super strength, and the ability to fire out lasers. In fact, Red Eco is so dangerous, it's way more likely to impact Jack than it is to take out his enemies. Red Eco is shown to give Jack enough force to break through the bone-based armor of his enemies. In general, these bones will take somewhere in the region of 3,000 and 4,000 newtons to break. With that, an equal amount of force is going to be directed right back into Jack's wrist. So at the very least, he would keep breaking his wrist and femur with every kick and punch. Man, can't you just let us believe that Jack can have the ability to one-inch punch a human femur until it shatters? Okay, anyway, that's not what we're discussing today. We're not going through Red Eco. We're going to the opposite end of the Rainbow Skittle spectrum to gaze upon what I can only assume is blue raspberry flavored. The electrifying blue eco. Now, this is the most prevalent eco seen throughout the entire original game other than the green eco that you get from enemy drops and crate breaking. Hashtag Crash Bandicoot. Blue eco is found continuously through the outset in the tutorial on Geyser Rock to the final stage on Gaul and Maya's Citadel. Fun fact. Gaul is voiced by the lead singer of Twisted Sister. Bet you didn't know that, now you do. Did you know that the voice actor for Baron Praxis and Jack 2 is none other than Mr. Krabs' voice actor Clancy Brown? 
What inspired you to build a second Krusty Krab right next door to the original? The dark powers I gave you can protect you forever! <laughs> Throughout the Precursor Legacy, Blue Eco is used to power up Precursor technology, using Jack as a human wire to power up bridges, open doors, and to even power up the entire opening village of Sandover. Okay, interestingly enough, this particular challenge in the Forbidden Jungle is managed through the use of mirrors, which kind of bounce the focused lightsaber beams of blue energy around the Forbidden Jungle before being fired into the windmill. But it's weird, because like the, it starts spinning and acts as the town generator. However, it doesn't make sense because the power of the energy on its own would never cause the windmill to spin. It, it, you know what, it just looks pretty, so I never really thought much about it. The much more interesting part of this power cell quest is the wireless energy transfer. We know it's powered by Blue Eco because we can get powered up from standing by the mirror. This energy is reflected and further focused with the help of these big mirrors with a convex lens. These bounce the energy around a forbidden jungle before reaching its final destination at the Sandover windmill. But the real question is, is how would a system like this work in the real world? And why don't we use a wireless system of energy transfer already versus the massive power grid found around the world? All right, Toggle, you're the smart one, so take it away. Before we take a look at how wireless electricity can be achieved, let's take a look at how electrical energy flows in your standard circuit. In these systems, electrical energy is transferred through electrical current through a closed loop. This electrical current is the result of a power source, which creates a voltage difference throughout the circuit. This drives charge carriers like electrons throughout the circuit. This can either result in the charge carriers being pumped in one direction called direct current, or can periodically be switched off producing an alternative current. As the electrons flow through the closed circuit, they flow down the potential energy slope that's created by the voltage. Once they reach the pump at the end of the circuit, low energy electrons are boosted back up to a high potential energy so that they can start flowing around the circuit all over again. So in theory, all we need when talking about wireless electricity is to have a machine that fires our charge carriers, most likely electrons, towards whatever needs powering up. Well, when we start talking about wireless energy, we need to start by talking about Nikola Tesla. Born in what is now Croatia, Nikola Tesla was an electrical engineer and inventor who is best known for his contributions to the alternating current electricity supply system. But that's not the only thing that the name Tesla is known for. To most of you, the name Tesla is either going to be linked with combustible cars, or you're probably familiar with this large mechanical monstrosity called the Tesla coil. In the summer of 1889, Nikola Tesla travelled to the Exposition Universe in Paris and learned of the research carried out by German physicist Heinrich Hertz into the existence of electromagnetic radiation. Inspired by this research, Tesla decided to expand on Hertz's experiments and produce the Tesla coil, which laid the groundwork for a way to supply power without the need for stringing wires across the globe. A Tesla coil consists of two parts, a primary coil and a secondary coil. Each coil has its own capacitor, which stores electrical energy like a battery. The two coils and capacitors are connected by a gap of air between two electrodes that generates a spark of electricity. This is called the spark gap. An outside source of electrical energy hooked up to a transformer powered up the whole system. This makes the Tesla coil essentially two open electrical circuits connected by the spark gap. These coils require an incredibly high voltage power source, which is supplied by the transformer, which steps up low voltage electrical energy to thousands of volts. Because of these incredibly high voltages, the coils are typically made out of copper, which is a great conductor of electricity. This power supply is hooked up to the primary coil, and the first coil capacitor acts as a sponge, soaking up all of the electrical charge. Eventually, this capacitor builds up so much charge that it manages to break the air resistance in the spark gap. And similar to a sponge, the charge gets squeezed out of the capacitor, and a current flows down the primary coil, creating a magnetic field. This massive amount of energy makes the magnetic field collapse pretty quickly, and generates an electrical current in the secondary coil. The voltage blasting through the air between the two coils generates sparks in the spark gap. The electrical energy flows back and forth between the two coils several hundreds of times per second and builds up the secondary coil and capacitor. Eventually the charge in the secondary capacitor gets so high that it breaks free in a burst of electrical energy, and this produces the Tesla coil's characteristic lightning. But this isn't all for show. This high frequency voltage is able to power up devices from a pretty fair distance. And it doesn't stop there. In a perfectly designed Tesla coil, when the secondary coil reaches its maximum charge, the whole process should start again, 
and this means that the device would become self-sustaining. But unfortunately, we don't live in an ideal world. And in reality, the Tesla coil will heat up the air in the spark gap, which will increase its electrical resistance. The spark gap will pull some of the electricity back into the gap, and eventually the Tesla coil will run out of electricity, facilitating the need for an external power supply. But you might be wondering why the electricity flows like this. Well, it's all down to a phenomenon in physics called resonance. This happens when the primary coil shoots out its own current into the secondary coil at the right time to induce the maximum energy transferred into that second coil. Now, this is all well and good, but the electricity coming off of a Tesla coil is way too wild compared to the electricity seen in the deep jungles of Jack and Daxter. Is there any way we can focus these electrical beams to make it more like a laser? Well, yes, there is. Meet the cathode ray otherwise known by its most earthbound sounding name, the E-beam. In cathode ray tubes, electrons are ejected from a cathode and are accelerated through a voltage supplied by the anode, accelerating at speeds of 600 km per second for each volt that they're accelerated through. Now this might sound pretty impressive, but in reality cathode rays are only really good for powering up the kind of TV that Jack and Daxter would have been played on back in the day. How about we take a look at something a bit more current? Back in September of this year, scientists were able to develop a wireless charging system called Distributed Laser Charging. This system used an infrared laser that was unable to harm the skin or eyes of people. This laser is shined through a spherical ball lens towards the device that needs charging. This device is covered with what are known as photovoltaic receivers. These receivers are small enough to be attached to many mobile devices and sensors, and the laser's 400 milliwatts are able to be converted to 85 milliwatts of electrical power in the devices. But why is this significant? Well, most wireless charging methods used today require a charging device for the item to rest on. Distributed laser charging enables self-alignment without the tracking process, so as long as the charge and receiver are in each other's line of sight, you will be able to charge up your device. Now this sounds very promising, but it is no way near the windmill powering light seen in Jack and Daxter. The main issue with this system is the power. At 85 milliwatts of electrical power, it would take over 100 hours of charging time to charge your phone. And at the moment, the system can only charge one device at a time, which really limits its usefulness. But the road doesn't end there. Even before this, the mouse had been trying to solve wireless energy transfer. Disney's research team attempted to solve wireless energy transfer with a method called quasi-static cavity resonance, where magnetic fields are generated to deliver kilowatts of power to receivers instead of infrared lasers. With this system, a room was designed that was lined with aluminium panels, with a copper tube in the center between the floor and the ceiling, and this copper tube had a current running through it. Inside the pole are 15 capacitors, which are used to set a resonant frequency in the room, and isolate electrical fields from a signal generator. This uniform magnetic field is then run through the room at a frequency of 1.32 MHz. The receivers use a coil of wire which resonates at the same 1.32 MHz which provides power to devices. The mouse research team was able to deliver about 1,900 watts of electricity with an efficiency of between 40 and 95%. But this isn't exactly a perfect system either. First of all, you need an aluminium encased room, which isn't ideal for a number of reasons. Secondly of all, the circular nature of the magnetic fields means that it only works when the receivers are at right angles to the pole. But I suppose this can be solved by having multiple coils pointing in different directions. And somewhat surprisingly, for the most part, this room full of electrical energy and metal plates is actually safe. Although people are being advised to stand at least 46 centimeters from the big metal pole with electricity pulsing out of it in accordance with US federal guidelines. So there we go. Surprisingly, Blue Eco and the idea of a wireless energy grid was thought of years before Naughty Dog came along with their surprisingly advanced precursor energy. But even so, it probably wouldn't be safe for the simple civilization seen in Sandover Village. I imagine that one stray bolt of electricity could probably cause one of the basic huts to catch fire. But this only scratches the surface of the Jack and Daxter science. As well as this, there's also intelligent plant life under Zuma, which I would love to take a look at in the future. And even then, don't forget there's also the future series of games with Jack 2, 3 and Jack X. And in there you've got hover cars, eco-powered blasters, and all sorts that I would love to take a look at in the future. Damn, that was a really nice trip down memory lane. You know what, I really hope you guys go and check out Jack and Daxter. It's such an amazing game. It's a lot of fun to play, not too hard if you're afraid of something, you know, challenging you. But hey, now don't you go and give all your love to our British friend over here, even though he's amazing. 
If you ever want to stop on by and say hello to your old bear pal, be sure to check out my Twitch at twitch.tv slash Jericho. You know how links work, you know how the URL works. You never know what you're going to find over there. So come on. As always, if you enjoyed this video, then don't forget to leave a like, comment, and subscribe to the channel. And if you want to help combat the ever-changing and frustrating YouTube algorithm, then make sure you share the video to help my channel grow. If you have any scientific subjects or topics that you'd like to see me cover in the future, then please tell me in the comments down below. As well as that, follow me on Twitter to get updates on the latest science of videos, and join my Discord for chats about science, gaming, and more. But until then, this has been the science of Jack and Daxter. I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. If you're looking for game based content, then you can join me over on Twitch, where I live stream three times a week playing all manner of games suggested by the community. Or if you want to support the channel even further, then you could also.